The Mighty Mars Rovers The Incredible Adventures of Spirit and Opportunity by Elizabeth Rush For many years, astronomy professor Steve Squires envisioned a robotic geologist that could explore Mars and collect data to send back to Earth. He and his team repeatedly proposed such a rover to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. NASA repeatedly said no, but Steve never gave up, and finally NASA said yes. Steve and a huge team of scientists and engineers worked feverishly to design and build two MERS, Mars Exploration Rovers, in time for a 2003 launch, at a time when Mars would be closer to Earth than usual. Despite many challenges and not enough time, the team made the deadline. NASA launched the rovers, named Spirit and Opportunity, into space in the summer of 2003. In January 2004, Spirit was the first to arrive. Steve and the NASA team anxiously waited while Spirit made her historic descent toward Mars. Note, in this selection, the author refers to Spirit as she and Opportunity as he. As expected, Spirit approached the Martian atmosphere first. She had made it this far. But landing on Mars would be tricky, requiring split-second timing. Many things could go wrong, fatally wrong. If the lander didn't pass through the atmosphere just right, it would burn up from friction. A parachute and retro rockets were supposed to slow the rover's screaming descent. But if they didn't deploy, the spacecraft would be smashed to a million pieces. The final stage of landing would be freefall, from 30 feet, 9 meters, in the air, protected only by a cushion of airbags that encircled the robot. Even if all went well, Spirit would bounce like a super ball, as much as six stories high, time and time again. Finally, she would roll to a stop, but no one knew where or in what condition. Steve Squires and his team knew that the landing would take about six minutes. They also knew that radio signals from Mars take ten minutes to reach Earth. This meant that for ten minutes of terror, scientists couldn't correct anything that went wrong. We would be helpless, Steve said, watching, waiting. Deploy. If you deploy something, you move it into position so it can be used. The entry, descent, and landing, EDL, phase begins when the spacecraft reaches the Mars atmospheric entry point, about 2,113 miles, 3,522.2 kilometers, from the center of Mars. To slow the lander's speed, retro rockets fire. Airbags inflate to cushion the fall. In the large room at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that served as mission control for the landing, rows of computers made a semicircle around wide screens and people packed in where they could find room. For good luck, all the scientists and engineers at Mission Control munched peanuts, because once when someone had brought peanuts to share during a landing, all had gone well. I tore mine open and began to munch immediately, the one and only thing I could do to improve our chances of a safe landing, said Steve. The six-minute landing began. Scientists hoped that Spirit would separate from her rocket properly. They worried about her burning through the Martian sky at 25 times the speed of sound. They prayed that the parachute and retro rockets would do their jobs as Spirit plummeted toward the ground. And they hoped that the precious little rover 
wrapped in its cocoon of airbags, would survive all the bouncing. The first announcement came over a loudspeaker from the landing manager, who handled the transition from flight operations to surface operations. The room became hushed. We have a signal indicating a bouncing on the surface. Mission control exploded with hugs, cheers, and tears. Steve pounded his fists on the tabletop, eyes pressed tightly closed. Are we really on Mars? Then everything stopped. The signal was lost. The room went silent again. A long minute. The flight team reestablished contact. We see it, we see it, we see it. Transition. In a transition, one thing changes to something else. Then the words Steve had been waiting for from the flight team. Surface, flight, spirit is yours. Spirit shook off her airbags and stretched her solar wings to charge her batteries. The scientists couldn't wait for her to start snapping pictures. From Mars orbiter photos, Gusev Crater, her landing spot, appeared to be a 95-mile-wide lake bed with a river channel feeding into it. Scientists thought Gusev was their best shot at finding signs of water. And there on the screen was the first image from Mars. Steve gasped. The colors were so perfect and the details so sharp, it was like being there. It works, man, it works, he muttered. The red, rocky expanse resembled the Mojave Desert with wind-blown dust and small, dark rocks casting shadows in the afternoon sun. The area was flat, with no big boulders or hills. Could this be what a Martian lake bed looked like up close? Scientists wouldn't learn more until Spirit, the mobile geologist, started driving, digging, poking, and analyzing the dust and rocks. It took days to maneuver Spirit off her landing pad. Then the rover drivers directed Spirit toward a small pyramid-shaped rock, which the scientists called Adirondack, about 10 feet, 3 meters, straight ahead. Expanse An expanse is a very large area of land, sea, or sky. Resembled If two things or people resembled each other, they looked like each other. Steve Squires, Center, reacts as NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe, left, looks on as they get a signal from the Mars rover Spirit after she landed. This is more complicated than it sounds. Signals from the rover, such as a photo of a dangerous ditch in her path, took 10 minutes to reach Earth. Commands back to the rover, like, stop, took another 10 minutes. Driving a rover is not like playing a video game. You can't just move your joystick and watch the rover obey. Instead, rover drivers carefully study the terrain ahead of time so they can safely map out the rover's moves. Roughly once a day, the team gets photos of the rover's surroundings. And about once a day, they send commands that tell the rover what to do. Spirit crept along, with her drivers correcting her direction daily. It took three days, but finally she pointed her tools directly at the rock. Would she find signs of water? We haven't heard anything from the spacecraft all day. Jennifer Trosper, the mission manager, told Steve the day they were set to use the RAT, rock abrasion tool, on the rock. They kept trying. Earth to spirit. Silence. Earth to spirit. Come in, spirit. Lead engineer Pete Tysinger called all the mission managers and flight directors on the team into the conference room. Ideas flew. Maybe spirit had shut herself down to cool off. 
Maybe her batteries were too low. Maybe the software had failed. Steve held on to one hope. Maybe Spirit would phone home the next day, as if nothing had gone wrong. Terrain The terrain of an area is what the surface of the land looks like. Peter T. Poon, Telecommunications and Mission Systems Manager for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, looks at a 3D panorama image taken by Spirit. Naming Names When Steve and his team talked about what the rovers saw around them on Mars, they couldn't just say, that crater, or this rock, or those hills. It would be too confusing. The International Astronomical Union, IAU, is responsible for naming land features on planets other than Earth. But the team had to discuss what the rovers should do daily, so they couldn't wait. Jim Rice, a geologist at Arizona State University and a rover science team member, suggested that features studied on the mission be temporarily named according to themes. Okay, Steve said. You're in charge. The team decided to name craters near Spirit's landing site after lakes on Earth. Bonneville, for instance. Craters near Opportunity's landing site would be named after famous ships of exploration, hence Eagle, the Apollo 11 lunar lander, and Endurance, after Ernest Shackleton's Antarctic expedition. The Columbia Hills were named after the space shuttle Columbia, and each of the seven peaks were named after the lost Columbia astronauts. But there were so many features to name that soon the rules fell apart. Basically, whoever started studying a rock or hill or crater got to name it. So there are place names, Adirondack and Stone Mountain, people names, Burns Cliff and Larry's Leap, and even foods, mud pie, chocolate chip, and cookies and cream. Whenever explorers go somewhere, we always want to name things, says Jim Rice. It's just something we humans like to do. International. Something that is international is shared or worked on by multiple countries. Adirondack, Spirit's first target rock, selected because its dust-free, flat surface was perfect for grinding. Spirit traversed the sandy Martian terrain at Gusev Crater to arrive in front of the football-sized rock just three days after the rover successfully rolled off the lander. Scientists named the angular rock after the Adirondack Mountain Range in New York. How to Drive a Rover Rover driver Scott Maxwell sat down at his computer and called up an image of Mars. But the image didn't look like a photo. It had the sharp angles and flat, bold colors of a video game. Using his mouse, Scott started to move the scene around. The sky was a dusty butterscotch color, as it is on Mars. The beige areas were parts of the scene the rover couldn't see because its body got in the way. We can spin it around, Scott said. The photo whirls. Zoom in on things that are interesting. A rock grows large on the screen. Even mark off areas that we think are dangerous. Scott drew red circles around two large rocks and a small crater. He clicked a rover into the middle of the scene and moved it around. Now we can sketch out a path that we want the rover to drive along, he added. It looks fun and easy, but it's not so simple. The rover drivers test the maneuvers many times before sending drive commands to the rovers. Part of the game is figuring out what things could possibly go wrong, said Scott. If something goes wrong and you break the rovers, there is no way to fix them. Rover driver Scott Maxwell on his first rover drive. That night, I lay in bed looking up at the ceiling, 
and thinking that right at that moment there was a robot on another planet doing what I told it to do. That was an incredible thrill. That feeling has never left me when I'm about to make something happen on my computer. I'm going to reach my hand across a hundred million miles of empty space and move something on the surface of another world. I have the coolest job. The control room for the rovers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Another tense moment at mission control. The whole team was there the next day when Spirit was scheduled to send a signal. We've got data. Steve phoned his wife. We got it, he said, his voice cracking. But too soon the cheering died down and the smiles faded. Spirit transmitted gibberish for two minutes and then shut off. It hit me then, Steve said. The whole mission could be over before it ever really began. While Spirit's engineers struggled to fix the ailing rover, another team of engineers was guiding her twin, Opportunity, toward his fiery landing on the Red Planet. They all knew that if Spirit couldn't communicate and Opportunity crashed, all would be lost. The mission would be a complete failure. Opportunity neared the Red Planet. Crack! Off came his rocket. Opportunity burned through the Martian sky. Whoosh! His parachute ballooned. Roar! His retro rockets thrust against gravity. Airbags deployed. Free fall. Bounce! Way up high. Bounce! High to the sky again. Bounce! Plummeting down and rebounding up again. Bounce! And again. Bounce! And again. Opportunity bounced about 26 times before rolling to a halt. Beep! Opportunity signaled that he had landed. Transmitted. When an electronic message is transmitted, it is sent from one place to another. Ailing. Something that is ailing is not doing well or is getting weak. Communication specialist Sergic Zadorian checks with antenna stations around the world to listen for a signal from Spirit. Don shot of an antenna at the Goldstone Deep Space Communications Complex, located in the Mojave Desert in California, one of three complexes in NASA's Deep Space Network, DSN. The DSN provides radio communications for all of NASA's interplanetary spacecraft, including the rovers. Chatting with the rovers In this story, the scientists and rovers seem to speak to each other using words. But scientists can't really talk to the rovers. To communicate, scientists type codes and commands that they beam to one of the three huge satellite dishes in Earth's deep space network. DSN. The dish passes the commands to a spacecraft that is orbiting Mars, usually the Mars Odyssey, which beams them to the rovers at an appointed time. You get a beep from the rover that means, thank you, I got my commands. Then you don't hear from it for the rest of the day, said Matt Gollumbeck, who manages rover planning. You can't watch the rover. You can't listen to it. You really have no idea what is happening. The team hopes the rovers follow the commands. Driving, taking photos, and testing and measuring rocks. At a scheduled time, the rovers radiate the information they have gathered to Odyssey via their low-gain UHF antennas. Odyssey, directed to listen at that time, collects the signals. Some time later, it downlinks the data to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory through Deep Space Network. The rovers can phone home directly to Earth using their high-gain antennas, but they don't have to yell as loudly or use as much energy if they send messages through the orbiter. 
and they can send bigger messages faster. That pleases the scientists, who are eager for their rovers to phone home. Mission Control erupted into cheers. The team was thrilled, but they expected to find less at Opportunity's landing site than they had found at Spirit's. Scientists had chosen Meridiani Planum because it was the safest area to land, flat and featureless. Opportunity would probably have to drive around for a while over the fine red soil, they thought, to even find a rock worth studying. Opportunity shook off his airbags, unfolded his instruments, and beamed his first photos to mission control. Holy smokes! Steve Squires exclaimed. I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm blown away by this. Just ten yards away, large layered slabs of rock jutted out in front of the rover. Opportunity had landed smack in a shallow crater, about thirty yards wide and a couple of yards deep. It was like scoring a great big interplanetary hole-in-one. More pictures flashed on the screen. Opportunity's photos showed exposed rock layers that scientists had never seen before on Mars. Steve's eyes widened. That outcrop in the distance is just out of this world. I can't wait to get there. I've got nothing else to say. I just want to look. Somebody called out. Did we hit the sweet spot? This is the sweetest spot I've ever seen, is all Steve could manage in reply. Steve Squires celebrates with others in mission control at the successful landing of the second rover, Opportunity. Why was Steve so thrilled to see rock layers? On Earth and on Mars, rock layers tell us about the geologic, weather, and climate conditions that prevailed during the years and decades each layer was formed. It's like rings inside a tree stump. Some rings are thick and others are thin, reflecting the weather conditions that accompanied the tree's growth. Steve and the other scientists looked at rock layers the rover photographed and wondered whether they were brought about by volcanic eruptions, blowing dust, flowing water, or all three. Over the coming days and weeks, Steve and his team studied the images that filled their screens and debated what they meant. Many of Opportunity's photos featured blueberry-shaped pebbles strewn across the soil, like beads spilled from a broken necklace. They were the strangest-looking things I'd ever seen on Mars, Steve said. Some team members thought the pebbles looked like volcanic hailstones. Others thought they might be droplets of lava that had cooled quickly. Like detectives, intent on understanding a clue, the team considered other possibilities. Maybe the rocks had rolled around in water, which smoothed them. Maybe material dissolved in water had dried out and solidified layer by layer to make the round forms. Was what they were seeing evidence that water had once existed on Mars? To find out, Opportunity took close-up photos, tried ratting, a blueberry, and took measurements. He discovered some salts. This magnified photo of Eagle Crater, taken by the microscopic imager on Opportunity's arm, shows coarse grains that scientists nicknamed blueberries. The examined patch of soil is 1.2 inches, 3 centimeters, across, and the largest blueberry shown is about the size of a sunflower seed. This high-resolution image, captured by Opportunity's panoramic camera, shows the rock outcrop on the rim of Eagle Crater, where the rover landed. These layered rocks measure only 4 inches, 10 centimeters high. Data from the panoramic camera's near-infrared blue and green filters were combined to create this approximate true-color image. Hmm, thought Steve and his colleagues. 
salts are often left behind when water evaporates. But some team members needed more to convince them. Opportunity kept exploring. We treated the rovers very carefully, said rover driver Scott Maxwell. We didn't want to make them do things like drive over rocks for fear of breaking them. Even so, discoveries poured in. Opportunity found jerosite, a kind of salt that on Earth forms in the presence of water, in acidic lakes or hot springs. Still, the scientists didn't want to jump to conclusions. Maybe things are different on Mars. The team pondered photos of ridges in the rocks. They looked just like ripples in the sand made by ocean waves on planet Earth. As the clues poured in, Steve and the other scientists became convinced. Other scientists became convinced. Evidence pointed again and again to the existence at some time of a flowing, salty body of water on Mars, said Steve. It was undeniable. Just weeks after landing, Opportunity had found evidence that water once pooled on the surface of this area of Mars. We landed, and boom, there it was, handed to us on a silver platter. We couldn't believe our luck, Steve said. But important questions remained. Had the water been warm enough and deep enough, and had it been there long enough for life to form? A view of Martian terrain with the base of Mount Sharp in the distance, left. Opportunity took this self-portrait in March 2014, right. Steve Squires shares the amazing discoveries from Opportunity's latest images of bedrock in Eagle Crater. NASA was able to fix the initial communications problem with Spirit, and she continued her exploration of Mars. But in 2009, Spirit became stuck in deep sand and ran low on power. Scientists and the public brainstormed ideas to free the rover, but nothing worked. In 2010, NASA lost contact with Spirit. For a long time, the scientists tried to re-establish contact. Finally, after more than 1,300 attempts to get a response from the rover, they stopped trying on May 25, 2011. In January 2017, Opportunity reached the 13-year mark and was still going strong, quite an accomplishment for a rover that was expected to work for three months. The exploration of Mars continues. In August 2012, a new rover named Curiosity landed on Mars and began its search for signs of life. And in their search for water, scientists have discovered very large deposits of water ice just below the planet's surface.